says 2.30, so. Good afternoon, our next speaker is Jock Little. Jock is gonna be talking about uh, incident response. Also, just as a, a note, keep your sidebar conversations, if you can, just to a minimum, whispering, it's a little distracting. Um, you know, he's got to put a lot of time and effort into the presentations and we're all here to learn, so there's nothing wrong with a little sidebar, but if, uh, you know, if you have to carry on a conversation, there's plenty of lounge space on this side of the conference area. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, no, no, hi, Dr. Nick. Jeez, come on. All right, so uh, talk is called A Cascade of Pebbles, How Small Incident Response Mistakes Make for Big Compromises. Okay. Uh, a little bit about me. I am a secu senior security consultant at BioPoint. Uh, I'm also the chapter leader for WASP Detroit. We got a meeting coming up next week, so come on out if you want to go hear about uh, what are we doing? Uh, designing for hostile environments. Um, I'm also a founding member of MySec, um, and I'm also probably the only InfoSec info, uh, pro out there who's got a degree in philosophy and medieval history. So it's kind of a weird way of how I got here, but. Uh, I also try and, or I try not to talk too fast, but I end up always talking too fast and going on and on and on and on. So we're going to try and keep that to a minimum today. I'm at Zombie Tango on Twitter and the other various things. Um, so yeah, I'm also a dad. And uh, if you ever wanted to know what does a two-year-old do with a jeweler screwdriver, she tries to pick locks with it. Um, I didn't teach her that. Um, I've never shown her how to pick locks. She's never seen it before, but she decided that's what it's for, so awesome. Okay, so the talk today is kind of a bit of a morality play. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the concept of a morality play. It's essentially a, a, a vignette into somebody's downfall for the uh, edifice of the listeners in how to live a more moral life. In this case, it's going to be taking a look at a specific, insta or a, a specific test that we were involved with um, and kind of taking a look at the mistakes that the responders did um, and kind of using those as a set of lessons for you know, proper responses and uh, improper responses to incidents, okay? So uh, as I said, this is based on a series of penetration tests conducted against a large company. Um, they have a maturing security program there. Uh, so they've got a decent infrastructure in terms of secure, uh, uh, you know, detection capabilities, different sets of controls, they've got processes in place, but they're really kind of working into this. And so really this test became a very good teaching tool for them in terms of, of learning still what they need to be doing, learning where some of their pain points and mistake places occur, things like that. Um, the names of, you know, we're gonna keep the, uh, the, the names of the, uh, the innocent here, uh, omitted for their production, uh, same with the industry that they're in. Um, and also, the, a little bit of things have been changed in this story, uh, more from narrative uh, 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 aspects rather than uh, to kind of hide anything. So the point of this is also not to pick on anybody uh, involved. Really, we're, we're not trying to, to uh, make fun of these guys or shame them. Um, it's better for people to make mistakes in this kind of a context than it is for them to make that same set of mistakes when it really, really matters. So we're gonna use this as kind of a training tool for both us and for them, okay? So the setup, uh, our client engaged us to perform a multiple week, really no holds barred penetration test with the ultimate goal of trying to get into a secure data network that they maintain. Um, so really we had no real uh, uh, restrictions against what we could try the only things were we were going to come from the outside. We were not going to be given any uh, uh, accounts or anything like that. We had to discover everything on our own, okay? So in the initial foothold was gained through a uh, somewhat uh, uh, simple but still uh, uh, elaborate social engineering attack. Um, and the total time we stay within the network is about three weeks. Uh, so we were really trying to um, represent that kind of evil three-letter word, uh, or th yeah, three-letter word kind of uh, a scenario here. So, all right. So the initial attack. All right. So as I said, it was a social engineering attack. We took a look at the external network. Um, 
the controls there were pretty solid. Um, they had some web applications. Some of them were slightly old. They were out there. Eh, there wasn't a tremendous amount of stuff to do uh, in taking a look at that. We did find one interesting uh, vulnerability in that they had an older control that would print the web page that was requested as a PDF. Well, the problem was is that the system that was generating that PDF was in the inside of their network, and so you could just request various different servers on the inside of it. So you started making up things like web.name of the company, intranet.name of the company, sharepoint.name of the company. You start getting back some interesting stuff. So we were actually able to do some reconnaissance on the inside by forcing this thing to print to PDF the content of that web page and sending it back to us. So that was kind of interesting. So we got some uh, uh, fairly interesting ideas about what we could use for social engineering pretexts from that. So the first pass that we did uh, it was pretty standard. We were trying to see, well, let's see if anybody actually falls for the just generic email that comes out. So we took a look at it and we found out that they were using a certain fairly well-known travel and expense vendor uh, for that kind of stuff. So we mocked up a little bit of an email that said, hey, we're changing security protocols as of this date. You need to install this new client's uh, certificate on your machine to make sure that you're going uh, uh, and are going to be able to access our new secure services after such and such date. Um, we had grabbed a bunch of email addresses by scanning through LinkedIn. So we essentially found the company page, pulled up all these things. We found some public email addresses. We assumed that the pattern that we found from the public email, addre email address matched to the whole company. We then set up a script that pretty much took all their names from LinkedIn, matched it to that profile, and created email addresses out of it. So we had mm, somewhere in the range of 120, 140 different email addresses that were potential. We looked through those. We figured out, again, using LinkedIn and Facebook, um, kind of figure out who these people were, what kind of level were they, were they director level, were they just general users, were they, what business unit were they involved in. We found some of those that would probably be more likely to, uh, to use that travel and expense vendor uh, in their day-to-day -day stuff. So if we found somebody that's the janitor, they're really not going to be sending out expense reports. But if we found that guy that's the traveling salesman, yeah, he's probably going to be sending out sales reports. So he's probably, go or expense reports. So he's going to be the, the, the more preferred target for that kind of stuff. Well, in the end, yeah, it didn't work. Um, here's kind of what we use for our, our email time. It's kind of hard to see there. Essentially saying, hey, come on, please install this Concur Solutions uh, Certificate Installer, which actually was a, a core agent. Um, so nobody fell for that. We were kind of disappointed. I was like, wow. Man, that they should at least get one person to click on the link to go grab the installer. Nobody. I'm like, damn, that was obnoxious. We put a lot of work into that. So we we're like, well, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're just not going to fall for that kind of stuff. Maybe it got caught in their spam filter. What the heck? All right, so let's, let's not abandon this. Let's try again. So we decided to really kind of ramp up the legitimacy factor in this state. So we went kind of balls out and developed an entire fake government policy agency that was within the sector that the uh, company was involved with. Uh, everything from website with news reports, uh, member content, a mission statement, uh, photos of their board, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, put that thing up there, sent the, out another group of people uh, an email saying, hey, we're partnering with your company. We want to get ideas on employee opinions within your sector on certain current and future governmental policy standings. Okay? Just come on, come please come to this page, fill out our survey. When they went to the page, we had the company logo there, we had their stock ticker ID, we had their entire uh, kind of like about section that we pulled from, the, from their website. We had that alongside with all the stuff from the government policy agency. And last but not least, we said, hey, to increase uh, 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 participation in this survey, we're going to give out a free Apple iPad to a random person. But we got to make sure that you are who you are. So at the end of this survey, we're going to ask you a couple of pieces of information about you. And hey, just to verify that you really do work for the company, we're going to ask you to log into this login portal that goes to your company. So 
we kept hammering over and over and over that the way that you're going to get this Apple iPad is if you finish this full registration. Any survey that doesn't have this thing, it's not gonna go in the drawing. That was in the email, it was on the front page of the survey, and it was at the bottom of the survey at the, the registration portion. So we're like, really? We really want you to just, just give us your username and password. And it was all fake. We had a back-end PHP script that was essentially pulling the user's full name, their title, their phone number, their username, and their password. We, of course, told them that, no, 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 the content that you fill into this form, it's going off to your company. We never see it. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. No exploits, no need to bypass IV, nothing else like that. We're just going to ask for their username and password. And it worked. Our first and only response was within two hours of sending out the emails. Our responder was a director level employee, longtime employee of the company, and close to retirement. And trust everybody, right? That's right. So this occurred ooh, roughly about 4 p.m. on the day that we sent out the email. All right. So the first pebble. All right. So we sent out this email. We kept the target list small because we didn't want to just really hammer this and really make a big deal about it. We wanted to get it fairly targeted. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't hitting anything that was going to set off alarm bells, anything like that. But it still did. One of the recipients of the emails took a look at that and said, this is fishy. He sent it down to the help desk and the security team. This was fairly close to about the time that we got our one hit uh, on our script. So he goes through and he's really kind of gung-ho in this. He's like, I, yeah, I'm gonna take a look at this. I really wanna figure out what's going on. So he's looking at it, he's like, I don't know. It looks legit. He Googles for our, our uh, think tank name and it comes up where the second hit on Google for that think tank name. I at least had the thing up for about a week before we actually sent out the emails. Google picked it up, it was on there. Hey, if it's Google, it's legit. He goes to the, he goes to the homepage of it, because we've got the web logs that say he went to the homepage of it. And he's looking, oh, look, he's got news ticker. They got, they got a board person. They've got all this kind of stuff. It looks legit. He does a DNS search, and finds out that I'd forgotten to create an MX record in DNS for it. So he said, ah, it's got no MX record. This has got to be spam. Congratulates himself, says, yeah, I figured it out. It's spam. I hate that word. I absolutely hate the word spam. Mainly because this isn't spam. Okay, spam is Viagra ads. <coughs> spam is, you know, Nigerian print scams in some senses. Okay, when the end user thinks of the word spam, hey, is this spam? They're thinking that kind of stuff. They're not talking about something that somebody went through a full week's worth of work to put together a completely fake organization that's very, very minutely targeted towards your organization. Don't call that spam because end users, everybody else thinks, oh, it's just spam. Nobody cares about spam. All right, well, that's a targeted attack. That's something in the realm of state-sponsored and, you know, high-end hacker organizations. That's, that's that level of stuff. I'm sure it wasn't just because you're, you were personally offended because all that work you did, you called it spam. <laughs> hey, I, I don't really care that he called it spam in personally. I just don't like the use of that word because it conditions end users to kind of think it's, it's the fluff that shows up in their spam folder in, in Gmail. Okay? Once end users start being able to think and figure this stuff out, in a sense for themselves and be able to take a look and see this is really something that somebody needs to know about as opposed to it just caught, caught in our spam filter and yeah, who cares about that? One of their IT guys, I take it? Yes, this is one of their IT guys that right, kind right, of took a look at that. Should have recognized it for what it was. Right. So once he decides that, hey, this was you know not legit, he starts looking to find out, well, what's the scope of this? How many of these things did we get? Who got them? What happened? Okay, some good response uh, ideas here. So he looks at the exchange transfer logs and he actually finds every single person that received our email. 
cool. You know the scope of it. Okay. He looked through their web proxy logs to see if anybody clicked the link. He didn't find it in the web proxy log. He said, nobody clicked the link. All right, cool. So he sends off an email to all the recipients to say, hey, this is spam. Just delete it. Don't click on the link. Don't fill up the survey. And he kind of put his hands together and he said, cool. I did it. Case closed. And the reason why we know that he sent out an email is we found that email in the deleted messages folder of the one guy who gave us his username and password. <laughs> so yeah, that worked out really well. So over eagerness and some bad assumptions. Okay, I give the guy super props for his effort that he went through to try and figure this out. He was really eager. He really wanted to figure this out. He really wanted to make sure he was doing the right thing. Cool. I give him props to that. Some levels, there were certain mistakes that were made. Some of it based on bad assumptions. Okay. Going back to my point before, should a highly targeted phishing email with a large amount of effort put into it legitimately be labeled as spam? No. This is an attack. Just because it came through email and it was fake doesn't mean it's spam. Okay, this was a very, very targeted, long, well thought out attack. Okay. Next thing, why do you think he didn't find it in his web proxy logs? Anybody? What was that? I hear. Say, I can't hear you. Actually, he was external to the network. He was at home when he clicked on that network, that link from his Outlook web access, okay? So it's not as a proxy log. He made the assumption that because it was a user and it was during the day, he had to have been at work and he had to have clicked on the link from his work email from his work user. No, Outlook web access works anywhere, even on his home machine. He clicks on it from his home machine. He fills the stuff out. It's not gonna be in his web proxy log. He never actually really contacted each person that was involved in the incident. Okay? He sent them an email, so in his mind, he contacted them. But he didn't call any of them and say, hey, did you click on this link or answer that survey? No, he just sent out the email, said, okay, they're going to read it. They're going to follow my instructions, and everything will be okay. Well, our target read it. We know because he deleted it. He also didn't bother to tell the guy, hey, you know what, I filled out that survey, we should probably do something about it. Nah. He also did not inform management that a hardly targeted attack was launched against them. He kept that information to himself, mainly because he said, oh, it really didn't affect us. Nobody clicked on the link, nobody went there. It's okay, we're all good. So there was a communications breakdown at that point uh, in informing the rest of his teams informing management that it, this type of an incident had occurred. Okay, so the lessons really need to know the difference between simple spam, the things that you know Postini stops ten billion of those things a year for, and a targeted attack, something that's actually being crafted specifically against your environment. Okay, the incident response procedures and responding training must include some clear escalation points and reasons for escalation, okay? That information shouldn't have just sat with that one guy and within their ticketing system. It should have gone up the management. There should have been some kind of consultation at that point that that type of an attack had been launched against their systems. You should at least report it, hey, I don't believe that anything really happened out of this, but that information needs to at least been made clear to some kind of a stakeholder. Communication, again, is key. He didn't really follow up with each individual user. Send an email, yeah. We all get thousands of emails. Nobody reads them all. And then users should also be assured that they won't get fired for self-reporting security incidents. We don't know if this guy actually had that in his mind, but it's a potential idea. Hey, I'm not going to tell anybody because I clicked on this link and I actually filled out this survey. Uh, I'm just not going to tell anybody and hope nothing happens. Okay. Part of user awareness needs to be that it's okay if this happens as long as you tell us about it. We can fix it if we know about it. If we don't know about it, it's just sitting out here, 
you know, we can't do a tremendous amount to help, you know, to help fix that. Okay. So we've got a username and password. Cool. We've got access to this guy's email. Cool. We're starting to look through that to kind of get an idea of what kind of a network we're looking at, trying to see if there's links and emails to find us, give us additional uh, resources, things like that. So at some point previous to, to getting into the network, we had done uh, a DNS reconnaissance using probably my favorite DNS tool, which is Fierce. Anybody use it? Fierce is awesome. Okay. Essentially, it's going to go through and, and, and enumerate through DNS records. So we find their, you know, cleverly labeled VPN server of vpn.company domain. Took a look at it. Sweet. So any connect SSL VPN. Sweet. Username and password. No two-factor. Double sweet. We were able to get in to their VPN using that SSL client as the user we got access for, and we're in the network. Cool. We bridged that portion of it. Okay. We're kind of going through some of the more of the internal pieces, mm, bunch of information and or enumeration, reconnaissance stuff later. We find a virtual desktop image that our user can log into. We log into it. We're using that thing now as kind of our jump base inside of it. He didn't have administrator uh, access to it, but I didn't care. I dropped a core agent on the machine, and I used that as a pivot point to start using it as just a TCP conduit. You know, it didn't matter to me that it really didn't have uh, administrative rights on that machine. So anybody know what that file looks like? And it may be hard to see down there. The file's name is scan report all vulns all hosts date.csv. Anybody a Qualys user? So this, uh, this was file was found on their file share in just a general folder, and it contained the last month's vulnerability scan. So my job was easy. Okay. So check file permissions. We got a lot of stuff just by trolling through the files, uh, uh, file share. There was a lot of interesting data relevant to our, our organization that uh, uh, was just simply found by just looking through the file share itself. So we took a look at that report. There was a bunch of really fun stuff in it. You know, there was some MSO8067. There was some JMX console, no authentication. There was some, uh, you know, some SQL stuff that we could brute force. We're like, cool, this is good stuff. And then the IPS found us. Man, exploits weren't working. Okay, and worse, the IPS was generating alerts. And even worse for us, we thought, was somebody was actually looking at those IPS alerts. Okay. So the IPS alerts get pushed down. They say, hey, there's stuff coming from this machine out into our network. Exploits being launched. We're seeing stuff. What the heck? Somebody finds out that the user that's logged into that, that virtual desktop that we were using was the user that we had successfully fished. And so somehow all of this gets translated into the user's desktop is doing stuff funny. Not sure how that happened. So the help desk was then dispatched to scan for viruses on the user's desktop. Okay, sure. I summoned the power of an AV scanner, yay. All right. They finally had, the response teams finally had a correlation between the user that we had fished and some kind of a level of malicious activity inside of the network. Okay. One of the big things that tipped them off was, well, why is this user trying to constantly log in as SA to all these database servers? What the heck? Well, I don't know. He could be doing that legitimately. I don't know. <laughs> okay. A anybody here who has a director level employee that logs in his SA to database service? Anybody? No, I didn't think so. So the virus scan comes back clean. Huh, okay, must have been a false positive. Uh, yeah, no. All right, so 
one of the things I've always seen in a lot of places that don't have mature security programs is that incident response equals scan the machine for viruses. If it comes back clean, eh, okay. We really need to be giving our responders a little bit better idea of what kind of things they should be doing when they see anomalous behavior besides just go scan the machine for AV. The worst, if it really was a virus, you're losing some valuable or, uh, uh, forensic information. And it, you know, very, very worse, you're missing stuff because you're looking in a completely wrong place. Okay. They also need to be trained on how to think through an incident critically. What are we seeing? What could that possibly mean? How would that possibly look on the machine or on the network? And how can we go find out that information to see yes or no, was this really something to be concerned with, or was it something that just happened to look really, really bad? Okay. Again, there was a communication break around, just like is in the first instance. Okay. The teams that were responding to these set of IPS alerts really didn't know too much about what was going on originally with that phishing email. The guy didn't really share it as much as he should have. Possibly if it, they had known that within the last 20 to four, 24 to 48 hours, there had been this targeted attack and we should be looking out for stuff. Maybe if that information had reached the other teams that were responding, they may have been said, hey, you know what? We did have that anomalous attack. Hey, that guy that we thought his user desktop was infected with stuff, he was on that email list. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe really he did fill out something. None of that happened. So there was a communication break. Again, when we're responding to incidents, we're not doing this stuff in a vacuum. We're not just one lone gung-ho guy going to go take a look at that. We're doing that as a combined team. You've got to have input from network, from servers, from desktops, from management, from you know, uh, directions, everything like that. We've got to have it all put together in a, in a cohesive unit. Um, if anybody was in for Dr. Joe Adams' talk, you know, he was talking about the, the whole idea of, of working together as a team, field craft, that, all that kind of stuff. Applies to this scenari scenario as well, okay? There has to be communication between these teams. There has to be um, proper and valid communication, clear directions, clear idea of what's going on, okay? I'm a big also believer in that, that we don't just mindlessly take what's coming in from tools, okay? My mantra with IPS and IDS analysis is don't trust the signature. Just because it says, you know, uh, MS 8067 on the network doesn't mean, well, one, that the endpoint's vulnerable, or two, that the attack was actually MS 08067 coming down the pipe. You've got to take a look and see what that check is actually doing. If it says, oh, well, it's the following URI string with the following byte stuff with the following host header, that's a little bit clearer than, hey, at byte position 10, you're looking for 08, OA, OD, EE. -E. Okay, well, well, that could be a lot of things. Okay, Don't blindly trust in tools, but also don't dismiss what you're getting out of them. You have the tool there for a reason. When it starts popping up alerts, especially a large set of coordinate alerts, so you see one host sending out exploits for this, 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 and this, well, it's probably far less likely to be a false positive than that one-off ping of the IPS every six months. Okay. Oh, we get uninvited to the party. So we are finally discovered. Okay. In taking a look at a couple other things that were coming out of that box, they finally decided, hey, we really should look at this RDP system. Hey, that was the thing that was originally causing those I IPS alerts. What the heck? So they take a look at it. They're like, what the hell is going on with this RDP search? Nobody even uses this RDP box. What the heck? They finally see, oh, it's this guy. Why is he logged into this? All right, so we get kicked off of that RDP session. We're like, okay, well, this is going to be the end of it. They found us. Game over. The help desk finally says, you know what? We're going to go talk to this guy. They go confront the guy. He says, yeah, I did click on that. I did fill out this thing. Okay. They're doing this four days after the fact, so yay for us. So they request that the user go ahead and change his password. Fairly common response in IR. Okay. 
the problem was is that the guy had kept all of his personal and corporate passwords as notes within Outlook, which we had been reading for most of the week. Um, so we also discovered that he liked to use a certain pattern for his passwords and just kept incrementing the end number. So we stopped, we got a little bit more coffee, and we tried the next number on the list, and we were back in the system. Uh, we never really left because our VPN session had never been terminated and we had 10 hours left on our 24-hour uh, VPN session. So all we really had lost was the ability to log into systems and that was for long enough for the Keurig machine to make some more coffee. The responders at that point decided, hey, we kicked him out, we got him to change his password, everything's good now, we can call his case closed. Yeah, no. We all give users through their, their, their uh, security awareness some kind of idea on how to pick good passwords. We make XKCD our, uh, comics about how to pick new pa great passwords. And users possibly remember that for the first 24 hours after their awareness session, and then they really kind of forget about it. And that's, hmm, it's not great. I don't like it, but it's kind of reality. But in this case, when we're asking a user to change their password after a known compromise, or at least a s suspected compromise, they really need to have good directed uh, advice on how to p pick a new password. Don't just say, hey, user, go pick, you know, go change your password. Okay, they're gonna go change the password the same way they have always done. Let's give them a little bit more ideas. Okay, can you please make sure we pick a strong password and give them some ideas on how to pick a strong password. Okay. This guy obviously didn't, and he really wasn't told, go pick a strong password. He was just told, go change your password. Okay, I change my password every month. I'll do it the same way I did it last time. Administrators need to know how all facets of their systems work. Um, kind of during the debrief, we learned that the reason why we weren't disconnected from the VPN session was that the administrators didn't know how and that they figured that since we didn't have a user account anymore, we weren't dangerous to the network. Ha, 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 ha. So probable but rarely used functions. You rarely are going to need to kick somebody off the VPN, but this incident shows the need to be able to do that when it really comes down to it. Part of incident responses is kind of doing pregame. Okay, it's that training sessions up and before the incident to actually be prepared to actually respond. Trying to figure things out and trying to train yourself how to respond to an incident while an incident is going on is probably a bad idea. And then after a compromise, especially a compromise of user accounts, we really need to start looking at those things actively, at least for a certain amount of time afterwards. We know Joe's account has been compromised. We think we've taken care of it. Don't just leave it alone. You've got a SIM technology. Put up an alert, that, or at least a report that says, hey, this is Joe's activity for the 24 hours after the, uh, after the compromise. This is his activity yet 48 hours after the compromise. Take a look and see exactly what has occurred after that compromise, just to make sure that you've actually gotten everything out of that system. So we're back in. We've got the user's new, uh, new account password. We're back on the network. Our VPN's still connected. We never really left. We're trying to find some more systems. We're like, okay, we really need to now be a little more careful with what we're doing. They're wa actually watching us. They're actually figuring things out. Let's be a little more stealthy. And then we discovered this loner desktop. It was called loner something or other. And Domain users just happened to be a local administrator. I guess that was the easy way of not having to set up individual user accounts as administrator on the box. Let's just make everybody administrator. Nobody, eh, nobody worries about those things. Cool. That's awesome. We're now on this box. This thing was kind of tucked away somewhere, and uh, it was now our new jump point for the rest of the test. So we pulled down the NTLM hashes for the administrator account, we pulled on a couple other things, and we threw them some, through some cracking routines. 
didn't come up quickly, so we're like, you know what? We got to get on with this thing. We're not going to try and spend hours cracking this stuff. I don't have a good cracking rig, so our poisoning. Why not? Let's give it a shot. Uninstall the AV on the machine, loaded up Kane. Sweet. We discovered that we're on the same VLAN as the network and server administrators. Awesome. Found out some got some good RDP sessions pulled into there. Use Iron Geek's fun little uh, script that pulls uh, keystrokes out of RDP sessions. That's a great little tool. And we had some domain administrator accounts, two of them. Sweet. So we stopped using our original account. We're like, well, this thing was already compromised once. We don't need to go through and keep on beating up on this guy's account. So let's start using some of these admin accounts. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't, you know, administrators take to the, you know, look at logs more than anybody else does. We didn't want them to get spooked and say, why the hell am I logging into that box? I've never logged into that box. So we created another mid-level access user. Our goal wasn't really just sit around and pop boxes. It was to get in this protected network. So we found some group names that were related to the protected network. We added ourselves to those group names. We don't need to be an administrator if another group that's not maybe as necessarily as highly watched as domain administrators has access to the same data we're at. at you know, administrator access wasn't our, our, our goal. The data was. So let's go where the data is. So we gave it a realistic name. We didn't care them like, you know, Hermione Granger or Harry Potter or, you know, <laughs> Iron Man or something like that. Um, so we added them a bunch of juicy sounding groups. We're like, okay, we'll use this account to try and find some more additional data and see if we can actually get into some of these networks that we're looking for. Okay. Well, again, detective controls work. One of the groups we did uh, add ourselves to actually was a monitored group. So their SIM device picked up that there was an addition to this group that was a protected change controlled group. Oops, on our part. Set an alert. Okay. The responder to the alert called the admin that created the, the admin that created the account and said, hey, did you call the, you create this account? We didn't see a change control for this. No, I didn't create it. Well, that's weird. Want to go get some beer? Sure. <laughs> okay. We have these detective controls for a reason. Don't set it up if you're not going to pay attention to it. But. If you ask somebody, if, or if you're asked, did you create this account and you didn't, something happened. It's probably not a good sign, okay? Our detective control worked, yay. Response, uh, D minus, okay? It had been less than three days since the previous in incident, okay? We really, this should have set off alarm bells. We just had an incident. Now somebody's creating accounts, and I didn't do it. It, ding, 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 ding. Some reason, no. Okay, so we're still looking for this pathway into the, into the protected network. We still don't have it. Frustrating. We, we're running rampant through this network, and we still don't have this thing. We finally find it. There were a set of jump boxes that we could use that had a full separate domain uh, and a fully separate authentication set, and we also found a management server, okay, a solar winds box. Cool. SolarWinds typically gets connections into everything else, which it did. So we've got two ways into this thing now, all right? The authentication domain wasn't a big deal because both admins used the same password for each domain. So that kind of defeats the purpose of two different authentication domains if you're going to use the same password. All right. Um, so we were able to use the jump boxes to get a whole bunch and pretty much almost completely fulfill our mission. So we got a lot of juicy information that we really needed to, to kind of to fill that portion of the test. Okay. Then it was the management box that finally got us caught permanently. Okay. So we jumped onto this management box. We were using RDP um, just to kind of keep control of it. We were looking around through that network. We were able to get host names out of Orion of hosts and boxes that were in that network. So that was cool. If you're doing pen tests, just use the admins tools against them. They know where all the good stuff is, so just ask them. 
Um, we dropped a core agent again so that we could pivot. So we were double pivoting. We were, well, I thought we were double pivoting. Uh, pivoting to the uh, loader desktop and then pivoting again back into the uh, management box. So we're kind of trying to double hide our traffic there and kind of let some stuff make it look like the management box was actually producing the traffic and not us. Okay. Damn, IPSs again. They had a fully separate set of IPSs within this protected network. Okay. We were getting late into the, into the uh, time period of the test. We probably had about a day or two left in the, in the actual allotted time for the test. If it wasn't for that, we would have been a lot more stealthy, but we're like, you know what? We really want to get that final 5%, so let's go balls out. Um, so first off, we found the IPS. We're like, this thing's just going to screw up our day. So let's see if we can log into it. Fortunately, neither of our admin accounts had access into that. So we decided to brute force the HTTP post login page of the IPS. We didn't get anything, but we were also kind of amazed that the IPS didn't detect brute force attacks against its own management interface. That was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, File that under things you should know about your security devices. Um, you IPS for the IPS. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so we did finally get kicked off the RDP session when one of the admins that we had taken the account of tried to log back into their session. And essentially, you know what happens when you RDP into a session that's already being controlled. You get the desktop of the person that was previously in there, especially when you say, yeah, yeah just reconnect me to my established session. So up on the screen as I got kicked out of there was the login page for the IPS. And the admin kind of was like, Oh, I don't remember trying to log into the IPS. I don't even know how to account for this. Oh, well. They thought it was strange that they were trying to log into the IPS when they didn't remember that, but huh, okay. So we kind of threw Hydra down to the SSH daemons that were on the protected network. And that was the thing that really kind of got us caught. We were noisy. We knew about it. And within 15 minutes, that got escalated up, and uh, luckily th that kind of came out in the middle of a staff meeting that all of the IT staff was having. So they were kind of forced to kind of communicate <laughs> together at that point, um, and that got us pretty much kicked out. Um, port was locked down from the machine that we were using. That thing was taken off the network. Uh, finally, we got our VPN session uh, killed. We were out and gone. Um, my pivot chain had broken down, so everything that I thought was going to the management box was going through my remote desktop box. Um, when Core decides to reconnect an agent, uh, it resets the local source address, so just remember that. If you're trying to pivot through many, many, many things, it resets it, so that's no fun. So that finally brought the on all hands on deck response. Uh, everything was kicked out. Our uh, primary contact calls us up and says, please tell me this is you guys. We said yes. They said, okay, we don't have to report to this cert that we have to report to. So glad that they didn't. Okay. So finally, in the face of overwhelming evidence, they were all able to coordinate effectively. They were able to pull together and actually get everything done the way that it needed to. Everybody started changing their passwords. Uh, just nice, newer, stronger passwords. Um, everything became hunky-dory. We kind of helped them figure out exactly what was going on and what we'd done in the, in the, during the event. Um, and so, good. They were able to respond to this huge macro event that essentially set off every alarm bell that they possibly had. It was all the smaller, little, tiny incidents, weird things, oddities, things that may have been false positives because I can't really prove that this thing happened. Communication breakdowns. All of those little things that at any point during the chain of this test could, should have gotten us kicked out, should have gotten us discovered properly, it didn't. Again, Dr. Joe Adams in his pre presentation before us put up a, 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 a quote from Richard Clark essentially saying, hey, we're not expecting the next digital Pearl Harbor. We're expecting a death by a thousand cuts. Okay? This was death by a thousand cuts. There was lots of little tiny incidences that could have been picked up upon that 
little bit more diligence, a little bit more effort put into the response could have gotten us caught. It didn't. Okay. So this should have been an hour long compromise. Okay. It was a week's long compromise. This is that type of, of incident where you hear about somebody sitting in a network for months or years. If we had been really stealthy, and if we had really, really taken our time, again, I don't think a client's going to pay for a two year long pen test engagement. It'd be awesome if they, if they do. If you want to pay for a two long, year long insert or pen test, come see me afterwards. But um, if we had been stealthier, we could have really stayed in that network for much, much longer. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Yes, sir. Uh, they were. No. So there was two people that had knowledge that this was coming down. The support staff did not. The instant response, the security teams, none of these guys knew that we were in the process of doing a test. So there was two people within senior IT management and uh, up at the CISO level that knew that this was going on. That was it. So we both wanted it because, especially the fact that they're a maturing organization, we wanted it both as a controls test and as a process response test. And really the value really was in that process response. That's where they got most of their value out of this thing. The controls worked for the most part. Um, you know, there were some things that we went back afterwards and say, yeah, we may want to tweak this and we might add a little bit more here. But for the most part, we were starting to get detection. You know, adding that member to that protected group, that change control group, perfectly came off. The response to it wasn't the way it needed to be. Yes, sir. Would have done a lot more reconnaissance in the inside. Would have done a lot more. Um, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have tried for exploits at that point. I wouldn't have tried for account brute forcing. Um, at that point, we may have been able to uh, use some of the access we had to do internal social engineering. Um, we could have been able to. Uh, you know, we were in. We had gained access to their SIM device, so we were actually looking at mostly the alerts that were coming through at that point. Um, so we would have learned what those things were, um, and then that, that would have let us at least target, know what we could target and what we couldn't. Um, we may have been really stealthy and decided to turn off an alarm for five minutes, go to do something and turn the alarm back on, um, things like that. So I, I think at that point, it, once you have time on your side, you can be a lot more, a lot choosier, a lot more uh, 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 discreet in what you're actually trying to do. Um, we kind of, you know, stop and drop that, that level of caution at the end. So, anybody else? All right. Thank you.